Uh, they tested over 3,600 people. Uh, so it was quite a, quite a mass testing event that they did there. So, um, so that was, that was a big thing there. And those numbers are starting to trickle in. So you're going to see some, some numbers that are probably a little bit higher than what we've had in the last two weeks, um, throughout the weekend, according to the, the department of health briefing that happened this morning is kind of what they're expecting. So I just kind of put the, the, by the numbers on here, like we've always done, um, the last few weeks anyways. So over a thousand active cases at 1044, 76 currently hospitalized, 2069 currently recovered. And then, uh, you can, you guys can see the death, 31 deaths. So there was another, another spike in the, the number of deaths this week. So just from my point of view, we just want everybody to stay visual, vigilant. Um, as things begin to open, we're going to have more cases. I think that's, that's been, been broadcast throughout. Um, a lot of the calls that I'm a part of, a lot of the calls that everybody else is probably on, is as things start to open up, people start moving around, weather starts getting nicer, we're going to have more cases. So continue to wear your PPE. Continue to keep an inventory of your PPE. Know what you have continue to train on donning and doffing it, especially some of the services who maybe haven't been affected much by COVID-19 yet. Make sure that you're staying aware and you're staying on top of this stuff. So one other thing, if you have protocols, please communicate those protocols to all members of your team. Make sure that if as the situation remains fluid and things change, that that communication is happening. So everybody involved, all the agencies in your community know what your change, what the changes are. Um, as you guys have probably had numerous changes throughout, throughout this, this uh, situation, just make sure you're continuing to communicate those. So when you show up for a call, everybody knows what to do and there's no question. So info again, uh, we talk about this every week but covid.sd.gov, cdc.gov, doh.sd.gov, and then the South Dakota EMS website. There's a very good link on there to take you to a lot of very good information for EMS responders. And then also for those of you that are part of the 10 a.m., the Monday morning 10 a.m. call that, that Marty and his crew put on, um, it's, it's very, very informative. So if you're not a part of it and wanna become a part, you can just talk to your service director your service director will get you, get you squared away there. So without further ado, if, is Keith Shariski on? Keith, do I have you? Yes, sir, you sure do. Keith, do you wanna start this evening by kind of telling us um, what's, what's, um, what's been going on in, in, in your neck of the woods? Sure. Uh, Brown County has 71 active cases going on. Um, we're having the potential of several clusters. We've got some um, populations that are having a hard time isolating after they've tested positive. The Department of Health is attempting to talk to these individuals in their um, native language and things like that and try to square them away. But we've been trans reporting um, COVID positive patients for the past three days to the hospital from private residences. In those private residences, there are kids, family members, and members of the public just walking through with this tested positive COVID-19. So the Department of Health is working on trying to square that away and try to help educate the community members for that. The potential exists for two clusters. Um, our two cluster sites, potentially, they are not declared that as of yet, is Dimcota beef and molded fiberglass. And I cannot stress this enough, they are not declared clusters of, of, as of yet but the potential is getting more real every day. Everything Fire Rescue is looking at implementing cloth masks for all on-duty staff in-house. The science behind a cloth mask do work, but remember, 
They only protect the people around you. They do not protect you. Um, I sent out I sent out some information earlier this week about the pardon me, I got the world working behind me right now. Um, I sent out some information. A couple engineers put together a cough demonstration, both with and without mask. Uh, this demonstration was not scientifically verified, but it does show the benefits of wearing a mask, um, keeping all those large droplets to within that six feet. But it also shows that droplets without the mask go 12 and sometimes 13 feet out. The reason why I'm bringing this up as a big deal is that um, the CDC, Chinese version of the CDC, University of Nebraska is looking to see if this can be um, an airborne transmission route. There has been no definitive science proving that as of yet, but what they're looking at is a, the best way I can describe it is an IDLH atmosphere where you're looking at, um, they're still trying to figure out how much concentrate is needed to make you sick. Those papers were reportedly gonna come out this week. I've yet to find them on the internet, so I can't speak as a um, expert to that, but I'm asking you guys to keep your ears open for that type of stuff. The Brown County EOC is still just talking now where our plans are in place. Um, the management on the EOC side has been talking to the Department of Health almost every other day um, and just staying together and keeping each other informed of what's going on. We do have an issue with the nursing homes. The nursing homes have reported to us that the South Dakota Department of Health has mandated that nobody can come into their nursing home, including EMS, ambulance services, for the purpose of taking a patient to a different healthcare setting. In the emergency setting, um, you still respond as an emergency. When I was told of this, I contacted the Department of Health. That is a falsehood. EMS ambulance services are considered essential and the Department of Health did not issue that order. For a couple of the nursing homes that are interpreting that as interpreting that ambulances cannot come into their facility, they have been um, visited with the Department of Health. While researching that particular concern, South Dakota is not the only one that has had that um, concern, I guess, brought up. North Dakota, and I've heard rumors of Wyoming, has implemented that type thing too. North Dakota, again, is not is not stating that ambulances are not to go into nursing homes. Now, with this being said, the nursing homes and both the Department of Health are stating that anybody, including ambulance service EMS providers, must be screened prior to entrance, with the exception of the emergent medical call. So you will be screened when you go to your nursing home. Your screening will consist of the big four, which is temperature, shortness of breath, sore throat, and cough. They're also making part of the screening as have you traveled outside South Dakota and have you come in contact with a COVID-19 patient. I do have a call in to the Department of Health to find out what their definition of a contact with COVID-19 patient is. 
Um, these nursing homes are not letting people in who have had contact. Right now, Aberdeen Fire and Rescue, um, we would be, 10 people would not be able to go into these nursing homes to provide care. Even though we've had all PPE and we screen on a daily basis. So when I get that definition from the Department of Health, I'll put it out to you, Kyle, so that Kyle can put it out. We are on track, as I can track the numbers, I guess, for starting our rise up to the projected surge, which is, again, projected first week of June to the second week of June. The good news is it's going slow, but we are now in the process of ramping up the numbers. Kyle talked a little bit about the mass testing that occurred in Sioux Falls. There's been some discussions on when and if mass testing is gonna happen in Aberdeen or Brown County, I should say, I apologize. Um, the Department of Health is still, they're still um, determining the trigger point for when mass testing needs to begin. I believe that is the, um, the short story. I do have a question over here. It says, do you have recommendations regarding a resource for interpreters regarding COVID? I do not have a resource at my fingertips right now, Dave, to answer that question. Um, the hospital systems have access to interpreters, but I, again, I don't have that information at my fingertips. I will attempt to find it and send it out to Kyle next week. Um, I hope that helps you, Dave. I'm sorry. Any other Keith, questions? Keith, we also have some information at the office. I can get to Dave also, or get to Keith. Um, with interpreter, uh, we had a Demcoda one that we were given some information on, so. Patty, thank you so much. Um, I forgot you're one of the most valuable resources for us. Um, absolutely perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Another question is, can COVID be transmitted by mosquitoes? At this time, science is suggesting no, but they're still looking into it. Um, it'll be, they're still, still looking into it. If I hear, hear anything, I'll try to get it out to Kyle to press out to people. All right. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Keith. Does anybody else have any questions for Keith while we've got him? Well, Keith, thanks a lot again um, for being a part of, of our weekly call. You, you provide us some very good insight, and um, we hope that uh, you and your entire team can stay safe through, through the, the uptick in, in Brown County and the Aberdeen area. So thanks a lot again, Keith, for providing some of that information. Hey, Kyle. Yes, sir. I forgot to mention there are eight active infections in Day County. There are no active infections in McPherson, Edmonds, Falk, Spink, or Marshall counties. Dickey County, North Dakota is without an active infection as well. Um, but again, the uptick is projected to begin right now. Don't let your guard down, everybody. Okay, thanks a lot for that. I did get a message that was just posted from a very special guest who we have on tonight who said that covid.sd.gov um, does have some multiple languages uh, or multiple language resources. So covid.sd.gov uh, slash ESL uh, would be the place to find that information. So um, that's, that's another resource as well. All right. So I think we're going to move on to our next speaker tonight is going to be Dr. Matt Owens. If you guys remember Dr. Owens, he was on the first, first two or three or four um, meetings that we had, and he provided us with some really good, really good insight, and we're happy to have him back again. So Dr. Owens, the floor is yours, sir.
I think you're going to have to unmute as well, Dr. Owens, if you haven't done so already. Am I gotcha. there now, Kyle? Yep, we got you. Okay. Uh, yeah, it is a Doc Owens in Redfield. I have the pleasure to have sitting beside me is Albert Wu. He's a medical student with Stanford School of Medicine. He's part of a contingent of medical students that have been elected uh, to come out to critical care, critical access care hospitals as part of a kind of an alternative uh, training program to help out with rural uh, care as we move into uh, I, what I believe is going to be quite the, quite the event here in the next few weeks. Uh, you may notice there are medical students uh, in multiple small towns right now. They were all done on a volunteer basis. This is a direct result of our Upper Basin Training Center, which has been in existence since I think about 2008. So if you see one of these med students, don't shake their hand. They know better. We know better, but tell them thanks. So let's if we can go ahead and pull my slides up. So we started with this about eight weeks ago. We still have a lot of unknowns, but we have a few things that we do know. Um, I do know eight weeks ago my hair was a lot shorter. I had no nursing home patients calling me a hippie, and I actually knew what a razor was. All those things have changed. But now we're going to talk about and we're going to reiterate a few things that we've uh, uh, discussed in the past and with some nuances uh, from some new knowledge. And are we able to move that slide forward? I think it's frozen. Okay, Michaela, we're froze. Let me try it again. You, you, were, you were still moving. I think you just have to, yep, just go up to the top where it says slideshow. You see where I'm talking? Right up there. I'm clicking on it, but nothing is happening. You could also probably just advance them from that screen as well. That would be fine as well if we have trouble with the with the presentation mode. Is uh, is Michaela on? I can pull them up too. Once yeah, why don't you just go pull them up and then I'll just tell you. Maybe working now. Um, Albert thinks he's got it working, so let's give him a minute. Okay, sounds good. Doc, I think Albert's been spending too much time with you if he's having trouble with technology. <laughs> uh, that's an inside joke for that's not so inside. I'm not a much of a tech person. So do we have them uh, move that around or what do you think, Albert? Sure. Yeah. It is working now. Okay, he's got it working. So let's let's go back to the bug. Let's let's talk about this bug because there's a lot to be learned. Basically COVID nineteen we all know is part of the severe lung disease, at least in some people. It's uh once again, it uh, affects the respiratory syndrome uh, system. We do know that it's affecting a lot more cardiac issues, neurological issues, uh, renal issues. But look at that bug. There's no legs on it, there's no wings. That's its only uh, way at this point in time that we can uh, pursue and mitigate this, this disease. Doc, I hate, I, hate, I, hate to, I hate to interrupt, but we're, we're not seeing this, that slide in the big picture. Okay, well, thank you for interrupting. Um, Michaela, could you just go ahead and click back and have her run the, run the slides? Well, can you guys not see the slides? We can just see the first slide. So you'll have to click on that number two one if you want the number two to be in the big picture. Hmm. Or you'll have to change which screen you're sharing because that might be the issue as well too.
Can you see a picture of COVID now? We got it. Thank you. Okay, so as to reiterate what I talked about before, um, th th this bug doesn't have, you don't see any legs on it, you don't see any wings. Um, so therefore, that's right now, that's our only point of either containment or mitigation. Uh, we've got some vaccine and treatments uh, uh, as far as vaccine and meds uh, being evaluated, but nothing on the near horizon. So we've got to work on the uh, better understanding of how this disease is spread and better how to mitigate against it. So when we look at um, symptoms, um, the major symptoms are cough, shortness of breath. Uh, one of the more interesting symptoms that's come up in the last couple of weeks, I've talked to a few neurologists, no one seems to fully understand this, is why is one of the symptoms, and sometimes it's the only symptom a person has, is there loss of taste or smell. But if you look above, it looks a lot like symptomatically like influenza. Uh, as we talked about eight weeks ago, one of the biggest problems with this thing is the incubation period still is not much better defined as it was, say, eight weeks ago. We still think two to 14 days with some outliers. If you look at the film on the uh, radiograph on your right, you will see what's uh, basically called adult respiratory distress syndrome. That is a lung that is uh, basically um, it should be black, there should be airway, there should be ventilation going on, uh, and perfusion. And a, a chest film of that caliber, and I do believe I see an ET tube up there, um, that's probably not ventilating well and it's not perfusing. So that's one of the more frequent causes of death. So one of the ways to think about this in terms of all U.S. mortality in that as of just a few days ago, we had about a million cases. We now have more people uh, have died from this disease than in Vietnam. And as of 5-5, five, five, uh, those are the data that we had at that time as far as cases and deaths in South Dakota. And what I'm about to show you, I, I believe that's going to go up fairly exponentially over the next couple of weeks. So where we are now, so let's spread this over time. Um, our dates, if you look there at the beginning, very low. You had kind of a low assault up the hill, and now we're, we're climbing quite steadily, especially after about the 20th. And we still, we're, we're not at peak, we have not leveled out, there's no plateau. So what we look at is predictive modeling. And the predictive modeling, if you remember the talk I gave eight weeks ago, I had a death count. Uh, anywhere from about 80,000 up to a million five deaths. And these predictive models are based on a lot of things, not just the virus, but the behavior of, of how people respond to this. And we're gonna get a little more into that as far as social distancing. One of the models that I tend to look at the most is uh, the model from Washington State. Uh, it's a health metrics evaluation. They predicted about 70,000 deaths by April 4. Remember, this was about eight weeks ago. University of Texas said May 15th about that. So the models aren't precise, but they do give us a good idea of where we're going. So when we look at this slide, I'm going to have uh, Mr. Wu explain uh, basically that scattergram from April 12th on to the 26th. Oh, okay, so basically the top graph you see over here, it kind of forms a bell curve-like shape. Well, it's basically a scattered plot of the deaths per day caused by COVID. And to note that this is for the United States, so it's not exactly representative of South Dakota. But as you can see, it kind of forms this in a dome shape, and we are already past the peak for the United States, as suggested by this graph. And in the bottom graph, it is a cumulative death for the United States. And the, you can see it starts out low, and it adds it very quickly and kind of levels off at the end once we are past the peak. Again, this is for the whole United States, and it is not representative of South Dakota. And let me add there, because of the population dynamics between, say, New York City, 8 million people, and the population of, say, South Dakota, North Dakota, when we look at this uh, deaths per day in the United States, 
the more urban areas may or may not have the could be, our data will be small enough that it probably won't shift that deaths per day in the United States. It probably will not move that curve just simply because of our population density. So one of the things when you get into studying pandemics, and um, I've been, this has been kind of an interest of mine, disaster medicine for quite a few years, uh, one of the best training models, it's, it's our own model from 1918, uh, basically the Spanish flu, although the Spanish flu uh, was not from Spain, it was from Kansas, uh, we were at the height of World War One, and we didn't want the Germans to know that we had it, and they didn't want us to know that they had it. So within just a few years of time, we had millions of people infected worldwide, about 50 million deaths, it has some similarities to COVID. Uh, there was no treatment or vaccine at that time. I can say that the, um, although we, it's similar that we don't have a vaccine and we don't have a antiviral for it like we do for influenza now, um, the wartime uh, and the level of science at that time uh, was one of the leading things of why there was so many deaths. So how does COVID compare? So once again, we're looking back at this uh, total United States, the actual, the predicted, on the uh, on the on our surge for the whole United States. In the next slide, we're going to pull that month out and superimpose it on. what the model of the 1918 pandemic uh, looked like. So you can see where COVID is currently, and then look down at what 1918 looked like. So they had an early rise, and this is what Dr. Fauci, I believe, is talking about when we look at uh, all these outbreaks. And of course, they all have different rates of death, but in the Spanish flu, you had an early rise, and it came back down to baseline. And then when it took off in the October of 1918 is really when the death rate per 1,000 people just shot up. And there was even another rise in the spring of 1919 before it uh, finally um, virtually extinguished itself. That slide right there is, uh, to me, is uh, quite frightening. So what can we do? And this is where the data really gets interesting. So University of Wisconsin had a, uh, and did a study, and I know it's kind of got some small letters up there for us over 50. Um, Stay-at-home orders can lower peaks. Mr. Wu, would you please explain um, what the effect of those on that right upper slide, uh, what the uncontrolled stay-at-home and, and what that led to number of uh, daily hospital bed occupancy. All right, so uh, as you can see, this yellow curve at the beginning is what the curve would look like if there is a no control, no social distancing, or any measures of that sort. You can see it peaks early and it peaks high. And uh, there are, it causes a lot of daily hospital occupancy, which makes it very easy to overwhelm hospitals. If you list it, if there is a stay-at-home order and it's listed after one month, you get this blue curve. As you can see, it still peaks kind of early and it's still relatively high, but it is much better than this uncontrolled yellow curve. And if you, as you can see, if you continue the stay-at-home order for longer and longer, the curve becomes lower and flatter. And this is what they mean by flattening the curve you have a much lower um, a peak daily hospital occupancy, which is, makes it possible for a hospital to handle all these patients. So the idea being is, once again, a lot of folks talk about flattening the curve. I'm not sure if everybody quite understands it. What it really means is, if you can, can keep a disease daily rate at a certain level, uh, that your the current health care system uh, can handle it fairly well. Once you go above surge, when you no longer can gear up and don't have enough, uh, say, ventilators or nursing staff or 
EMTs or whatever, um, then you really, it's quite problematic because there's not a lot you can do about it. So the Wisconsin data is basically stay at home orders. Columbia did even a better study. I thought, well, not that it's better, but it tells us what to do as individuals. Social distancing. So we all know about the six foot, six foot might become eight foot. But look at this, this uh, data here on the right lower quad, uh, corner. I find this quite compelling. So if you look at the number of cases with red being um, 20%, yeah, 20% reduction, um, if you get 20% of people to decrease their social contact, um, you get a little, you see that rise, and then when you get 30%, see how much that disease rate drops, and then when you get to 40% and above of people doing things like wearing masks, staying six feet foot apart, um, doing everything that we've been talking about, look how fast that curve drops. And that's where we're going to, when we get to messaging, and I give a similar talk this week uh, to the school teachers uh, here in Redfield, this is where as EMTs, medical personnel, teachers can model behavior that will decrease our incidence of the disease and the death rate. I, as I teach this in different groups, I keep going back to that picture of that um, uh, coronavirus. It has no legs, it has no uh, wings, so if we model appropriate behavior, we stop its transmission. That slide that we just saw shows that. Now going back to 1918, this is also a very interesting slide. So during 1918, there were these huge war bond rallies where it was greatly politically beneficial for mayors to get as many people out in the streets to raise money for war bonds. Uh, basically, at the same time, two uh, different uh, cities had two different approaches. Philadelphia went forward with its um, war bond, you know, 30,000, 40,000 people in the streets. St. Louis mayors said, uh, and government said no. Look at the difference, at least with influenza, the difference between social distancing, where you had a death rate of 250 per 100,000 population, in Philadelphia, and at the same time, uh, in uh, St. Louis, you're down in that 20. That's an incredibly power, powerful uh, statistic to look at of the effect of social distancing. So projected cases, and this is um, basically where we're at as far as beds and ventilators. Um, if we have no containment, you can see the front end there. And if we, um, if we keep with the blue, which is our current hospitalization, our current action strategy, you see how that curve has been pushed off into June, where it drops the total number of cases and the requirements for ventilator ICU beds um, quite dramatically, and I would say if we could get a, the message out to South Dakotans, and as EMTs and school teachers, I can't think of any better educators to get this concept across, that if we do good social distancing, we can drop that blue curve down significantly. Just look at the Philadelphia and St. Louis data. So what can we do? Um, COVID, is a pandemic that's very widespread and is going to get worse. I won't say may get. Um, models that we've discussed and countermeasures that have been shown to work in a variety of diseases and in this disease also, uh, the countermeasures are social distancing. Uh, they limit the rate of infection and basically these can be implemented over most of the country. So we got to get the teachers, the healthcare providers, the I see Mr. Carl Perry with the legislatures on, get those folks modeling good behavior too. Um, we reduce transmission risk by what basic behavior 
uh, that we all know. Now we've got to teach it to other people. If you're within six foot of me, you're too close. You wear a mask. You wear a mask for two reasons. One, you're showing respect to the people around you because it actually has been shown more to prevent spread, let's say if I'm wearing a mask from me to somebody else, than protecting me unless it's an N95. The other thing is wash your hands. Uh, one of the other concepts of the social distancing is you layer in those parts of the economy that we got to keep running, things like grocery store, hardware stores. What I'm seeing here locally, we basically locked Redfield down eight weeks ago, and as we're opening back up, um, you come in the grocery store, you get your hand wiped down, you're given wipes, you wipe off the um, grocery cart, you go about your business, you're six foot apart, uh, you go to checkout, they wiped everything down, the glass uh, and the plastic uh, air um, dividers are up and you pay with your debit card and that's exactly the model that we need to see across all of South Dakota. And the most important part, and this is going to be a tough one to get across as we open up because of the financial strain, is people have to stay home if they have symptoms. Most people, if they're not over the age of, say, 60, uh, can shelter in place with this disease. Matter of fact, one of the biggest problems with the disease, I'm sure you're all aware of this, is especially folks under the age of 30 can be just absolutely spilling virus everywhere and not have any symptom whatsoever. It'd be a more honest virus if there were such a thing, is that if everybody that had uh, COVID had symptoms, we probably wouldn't be where we're at. So for predictive modeling, I would recommend uh, those four uh, places to look. And the take home is, is the volunteer rural EMS, the school teachers, those involved in healthcare, we need to model within our own communities appropriate behavior as uh, explained earlier. I hope you folks found this somewhat useful. It's kind of a recap and a little bit more of a, uh, uh, a finesse uh, presentation, at least I would hope, than the one we did eight weeks ago. And I want to thank Aberdeen Area AHEC uh, for acting as the platform for this. Doc, it's Kyle here. Got a couple of questions that popped in. Um, one of them is, I think most of Carl's were answered there with, with what you'd said. Um, one popped in is, is how long is social distancing going to happen? Do you see it happening into the fall, next year? Is it, or is that all kind of based on finding the therapeutic um, drug for it that's going to work and then also a vaccine? Right. And so when you, you look, and, and if I could answer this question, <laughs> I could retire tomorrow. Um, to what I see in the big picture of this, until we get a, an effective vaccine, and an effective antiviral, this is the new normal. Because these viruses don't just disappear. It'll go around the globe and then it'll come back again. Uh, we've worked, look at all the nursing homes. You know, we've locked down nursing homes, at least in Redfield, for eight weeks. There's other communities that have locked down their nursing homes and done all this uh, preventative measures and it still kind of sneaks in. And frankly, the death rate in our elderly is uh, incredible. I mean, I grew up during the Vietnam War when people were protesting the death of, of American soldiers in Vietnam, and that was in that 50,000 person category. We're in the 70,000s now, and it's going to take a little bit of a push, and it can't be blue and it can't be red. It's just got to be medical. It says, to protect each other, we have to follow what the, what the science tells us. The science tells us, where this, uh, this field of Dr. Fauci's quote, the virus will show us what it's going to do. Our only thing to do is do what we know which is best, which is wear masks, wash your hands, you don't, kind of like what my mom taught me, if you don't feel good and you're, you know, cough, wash your hands and stay at home. It's pretty common sense. Now, getting that done across the whole nation, um, 
especially in those areas that are more urban, uh, is somewhat difficult because of just like commuter traffic and that sort of thing. We're out here, as long as the EMTs keep modeling, the teachers keep modeling, and the docs keep model, modeling appropriate behavior, we can at least slow this thing down. Doc, I did another question that popped in early on was, uh, when are you considered cured of COVID? Um, can you get it again? Is that still kind of up in the air? I know I've been hearing throughout the weeks that um, until there's a really good basis of antibody testing, that we're really not going to know that extent of how long maybe you have those antibodies to fight it off. Is that kind of what you're hearing as well? Yeah, and, and I'm with the CDC on this. There's going to have to be extensive testing, one, uh, to make sure the IgG, IgM, whichever, um, I think it'd be IgG, uh, antibody you want to test, and number two, how accurate is it? And then the big question that's got a lot of physicians really scratching our head is, so if you get infected with COVID-19, today's version, does it offer any immunity to six months from now? Because we know with influenza, which is now endemic since 1918, just because you got it in 2019 doesn't mean that you're immune to the 2021 virus. Do you follow that logic? So I'm not saying that immunoglobin testing is wrong. I'm just saying it's got to be part of a bigger, a bigger picture. Right. Another question that popped in was in small communities, small rural communities, how do you get people to wear masks when they think it's taking away one of their freedoms? What type of education would you throw out there? And I guess this can be for anybody who's on the call who's maybe dealt with this. My response would be is, once again, just this, first you show a behavior by wearing a mask. Like, I don't know if anybody in any business in Redfield has seen my face in eight weeks. Um, first you show it, you model it, then you reinforce it. And you reinforce it by saying, thank you for wearing your mask. Um, we can't force people to wear a mask. But if you model it and you show it and then you keep repeating that this is the right thing to do, because it's the right thing to do to protect our elders in the, in the, in, within our communities, um, I think people, health clubs are pretty good about trying to protect each other. All right, and then if, if you guys are watching the chat box at all, Keith did put some, uh, some info on there. Um, I did get a definition of um, close contact. Close contact is defined as spending prolonged periods of time in the same room, more than five minutes. Direct personal contact, which an example would be hugging. Uh, contact with respiratory secretions, meaning if somebody coughs on you or near you or sneezes on you or near you or you share the same eating and drinking utensils. That would be kind of that, that definition. And that definition is gonna be on the Department of Health website as well if you're looking for something like that. By the way, I'm gonna add, um, the South Dakota Department of Health has done a great job on this. They've got very clear cut, very easy to understand recommendations on their website. And I'll also share with, uh, I don't know if there's any other physicians on this talk, uh, your physicians, if you folks get a little confused about what's right and what's wrong, um, this, the data on this thing changes every two or three days. So what I, just to, what I told you eight weeks ago, I was gonna include some of those slides that now are not correct, but I thought I would just make the talk longer and you already know that a lot of things have changed. What we're talking about right now, I, in four weeks, will be, I'm not saying incorrect, but it won't be as correct as what we'll know in four weeks. Exactly. I think that's, that's just where, where everything, where everyone can just stay up to date with the latest CDC guidelines, the latest state guidelines, and, and things like that, and getting your definition or getting your information and the definitions for certain things from those websites and not from the news media because we see it all too often the news media is is maybe not telling us exactly 
what is the truth or it's telling one side and not the other. It seems like our news media, unfortunately, has made this thing political, and that's not what we want. Total agreement. Total agreement. Just one last thing. We do need some humor around here. So I'm thinking every towns, whatever they're like, we're the Redfield pheasants, should start marketing pheasant masks. And if you're a bobcat, you got a bobcat mask. And then if we ever do get back to the point where we have, uh, let's say, basketball games where people are there, be a way to support your team and do it in a safe way. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Did have a, a, a comment that popped in um, from Lori. Um, had a situation where we were exposed to COVID, but didn't know if the person was telling us the truth because he didn't want to go to jail. Couldn't get info, so we knew it. Couldn't get info, um, so they didn't know for sure. So I guess our suggestion there is probably just make sure that you're, you're – following through with with wearing your proper PPE and things like that which I'm sure you guys were but but yeah those are situations that we're probably going to start running into is people are going to start using COVID in situations where maybe they shouldn't um, so it's unfortunate um, I do have somebody that would maybe like to address that um, yes Marty if you would like to address that go right ahead we appreciate yeah. you being on. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate um, everybody being on and the work you guys are doing. It's great. So I wanted to address this question from a Department of Health perspective. When when a patient tests when when a patient tests positive, one thing that the department will do is, uh, if it's say it's a state laboratory, they will contact the PCP. So for instance, Owens would Owens would get a call and say, Hey, this patient tested positive in your in your clinic today. Once that result is given to the PCP, then our disease intervention specialists get a hold of the patient and they immediately start to do contact tracing. And we, we identified this early on at the state EOC and, and determined that it was absolutely vital that that information be passed down to EMS. So if you transported a patient that has COVID, you will, you will get a, a phone call. Now it may take a couple days or it might take over a week, depending on which laboratory uh, conducted the test. State laboratory usually turns around in one to two days, whereas um, some of our independent and out-of-state labs uh, can take up, up to a week. But that is part of the loop closure process that any EMS crew that has been exposed to a positive COVID, COVID patient uh, will be notified. So um, I hope that reassures some of you. Obviously, we want to make sure that we continue to follow the guidance and, and uh, CDC guidance for protecting ourselves and our families and our patients. So thanks. Hope that addresses that. Thank you very much, Marty. And thank you for being on. You bet. For, those, for those of you that don't know Marty, Marty's the, the state director um, for emergency medical services in South Dakota. So it's, it's wonderful that we we're able to have him on. So we appreciate him. One other question I got for anybody who wants to answer this so I I sent some stuff out, um, uh, some stuff that the U.S. Air Force is doing using a, it's a chemical called CALA, and they're using a, a power washer hooked up to a, uh, uh, basically a paint gun. Um, has anybody tried that? And, and by the way, is, is Colonel Kirkpatrick on the line? Because if he is- Yes, I am. Hey, hey, Dan. Have you got any more information on that? No, they're still using it. They um, they like it. They prefer it. It's what the Air Force has developed, or not developed, but it's what they're using. Okay. So they're using it for air assets, and there's probably no reason why we can't use it for ground assets. Did you, did you hear me, Dan? If they're using yes. that for air assets, it should be yes. good for ground assets. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Anything you can add on that? No, the Air get... Force is using that, that chemical to get rapid turnaround for um, 
paramedical evacuation. When they transport a patient who they suspect may have COVID-19, they want to be able to turn the aircraft around uh, as quickly as possible. And that chemical, you spray it on, you let it sit for 10 minutes, you wipe it off and you're good to go. That's that's why they um, they found it. And it was actually developed for use in aircraft, but there's no reason that I know of why it couldn't be used for ground transport. And there's no wipe up, there's no clean spray, wait and go. Yeah, just wipe and go. Thanks. It's called Cala 1452. Colonel Kirkpatrick, could you, could, Colonel Kirkpatrick, could you put that in the chat box, what it's called? I did have somebody sure. that popped in with a question that said, could you please explain that a little more? Phil, did, did we get an explanation on that? If he puts the, if he puts the name of it in the chat box. Uh, hopefully. And if I can jump back in, this is Doc yes. Collins. Sure. Yeah, he even includes a parts list of what you need to hook it all up. Very military, Dan, very military. <laughs> Outstanding. Does anybody else have any other questions for any of the folks that we have on online tonight? We have a quite a plethora of, inform or of experts that we do have on. Does anybody else have any, any questions for these folks? Yeah, now that I got a, okay. I just see it popped up. I was gonna say, I got a pen and paper now and I just see that he popped it up. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, and we did have somebody else pop in from down in Stratford that said that um, every place online that sells the, this chemical is out or stock or out of stock or back ordered until December. So keep looking, maybe we'll find some somewhere along the way. Um, in the meantime, there's, there's a lot of different resources on, um, on, on that. Okay, so we've got two other questions that popped in. I've got with dental offices opening, what are the feelings on that kind of environment? Does anybody have an answer for that one? Or a thought? I guess I can probably jump in there a little bit. I have not been to the dentist since they've reopened, but from what I'm hearing is they're taking extreme precautions. I believe that you are getting questioned before you're even coming to the dentist. I think you're getting temp checked uh, and so on. And I believe that uh, obviously the, the, the folks at the dental office are gonna be wearing masks. I don't know if anybody else has anything on that or not, but I mean, it's, it's probably one of those things where if you need to go because you're um, dealing with something, I don't think you should be afraid of the environment, especially if, if they, the, the dental office has a good, a good plan in place. And I think that it's, it's completely within your right to ask them what their plan is, is how they're screening their, their employees, how they're making sure that everybody is, is staying safe. And then, and then also, you know, if it's something that can be put off, maybe, maybe it's okay to, um, you know, maybe it's okay to, to, to put it off if, if, if you wanted. Um, so I think it's just kind of going to be, going to be uh, one of those things where if you need to go, just don't, don't hesitate to ask them about the plans that they have in place. Um, Carl Perry did say he's going to be there at 10 on Monday. So maybe he can give us a little bit of an update on Thursday. Um, the other question that came in is, does anyone have access to an electrostatic sprayer? If anybody has access to that, you can get a hold of Keith Shirisky. He's the one that asked that question. Um, just a comment that came through as well. Uh, somebody was at Walmart in Aberdeen today. I was customer number 262 inside the building, and I saw less than 10% of the people wearing masks and or gloves. Is this enough coverage? Uh, does anybody want to take that question? Doc Owens, you want that one? I know what you're going to say. Does that, does absolutely wrong mean something to people? That's, that's insanity. You wear a glove, the gloves, I, I'm not so hung up with the gloves because the, uh, with the hand sanitizers in and out, but the, those masks have got to be worn. There's, um, 
probably not, I think somebody joked at one of our meetings, probably not to the bank, but anywhere else you probably, yeah, just, just a plain cloth mask uh, has been shown to decrease both you giving it to somebody else and improve your outcome if you get cough, sneezed, or just being in the airspace. And then we had another comment that came in, is the CARE 19 app. Um, over 18,500 people have signed up for that. Um, I, from what I understand on that, I, I haven't been, been pinged on it for coming into contact with anybody else that has it, but it does seem like it's a very good app. I know they worked out some bugs that were in it a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I think it's a much more user-friendly app right now. Um, and then as far as care, Carl, what what do you have on that one? I'll just turn it over to you on that one if you had something on that. There. Hello. I'm sorry, but once in a while, technology is way too smart for me. But uh, on the CARE app, I have it, and uh, there are like 18,000 people in South Dakota that have it, and it's, it's really a simple thing to do. You go into uh, your apps and look at the CARE app, and it's your CARE 19 app, and there's no charge for it. And uh, there are some people that say people know too much about you, and uh, I'm a politician, so I don't care if you know about me. And uh, But in here, it, it keeps to you the entire day. If you go to Scotty's for lunch, it's on there. If you go to Ken's for uh, groceries, it's on there. If you go somewhere for a bike ride, it's on there. You go to Chrysler Center or somewhere to fill gas, it's on there. And the reason it's important, it's just like when uh, the doc was talking about wearing a mask, uh, you know, you don't need it if you don't get COVID, but if you do get COVID, then the state of South Dakota and Kim Nelson, uh, Ryston and her people, the governor and her people, you know, they need that information so that they can find out who you've affected. So I, I think it's a good idea. Is that what you want me to talk about, Kyle? Yes, sir. Yep, that's great. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything this evening? I have a question for Dr. Owens, if he can answer. Sure. I've seen some headlines, but I have not read the articles about um, New York being surprised at how many people that have sheltered at home have actually gotten the virus. Has he read anything about that? No, and, and, and until we get, um, they're, they're nowhere near where they can actually, they're still in the battle. And until we can get really good broad spectrum testing and then ask people, where were you at? Um, I think it's a little premature to jump on that data. I've seen a little bit of it, but I you got to have an end number in the city of New York of maybe 10, 15,000 uh, in a study group to really make sense of that. And that's just a rough estimate I was, uh, as far as from a mathematical standpoint. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any, any other questions or comments tonight? Well, with that, um, I want to thank Dr. Owens and, and Albert Wu for putting on the, the presentation. I want to thank Keith Shariski for talking to us about what, what, what he had, uh, what he's been dealing with, and, and, and um, what they've been, been working on here at Aberdeen Fire and the surrounding counties. And then also big thanks to Marty Link for being on and giving us some input as well. Um, again, a reminder for next week, we're moving to Thursdays. And we're going to be at 7 p.m. on Thursday, and we will have Governor Noem to start that that call. So if we could all get on by about 10 to 7, that would be great. Um, so we're really excited to have her. Like I said, there won't be any any question and answer session there. So if you do have a burning question that you'd like to ask her, that's not politically d d divisive or anything like that. Uh, Go ahead and send me that that question and i'll forward it on to her folks to see if if she would answer it for us but as of right now there will be no public q a on that one um michaela sandy do you guys have anything tonight
I do not, but thank you for once again to all the speakers who were able to talk and share their experiences. This is Sandy. Appreciate every, everyone being on. A special thanks to Marty and thank you, Dr. Owens. It was great to hear another presentation from you um, and keep us all accountable for wearing our mask. So thank you. All right. Um, just one quick thing before we sign off for the night is if you have not gotten your hours, if you're an EMT or EMR and you have not gone into the South Dakota EMS portal and signed up, make sure you go ahead and register for that. You can register until 1030 this evening. And if you don't know how to register, send me a message. I'll be taking a look at it um, probably Tomorrow, I have a little bit, I have access a little bit later than you guys will. So I'll make sure and try to fill in anybody who didn't get on that did not contact me. But just make sure that you contact me so you're able to get your hours. And we'll see you all next Thursday night at 7 p.m. Have a good week and stay safe. Thank you.